Yesterday, the CDC released its November 3rd edition of Morbidity and Mortality Weekly, which clearly documented vaping drove used tobacco use to a 50-year record low. Yes, total teen nicotine use and smoking are at the lowest rate since I have been alive. However, there hasn't been a single news outlet or reporter who presented this historic moment for what it truly is. Every news outlet is still marching along with their fear-mongering headlines and misinformation to drive clicks and ad revenue to their story. One particular headline from Earth.com infuriated me so much that I sought out the author and the publication's Twitter handle to let them know that they're missing the mark and contributing to Trash Flash. Chrissy Sexton, this third episode of the Facing Hypocrisy podcast is dedicated to you and all of your reporter cohorts. So ain't nothing to it. But to get into it. Here you go, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the article today. The title and the current headline is Vaping Epidemic. Nearly half of students who try e-cigs get hooked. Okay. That's not what it originally was. But quite honestly, it's no better than what you had originally. Because you missed the point. The very first two words inside of this article headline, Vaping Epidemic, is a misnomer. It doesn't exist. Perhaps, perhaps you can take a look at it from 2019 and go, okay, 2019, there was a massive sudden uptick of youth vaping, and you want to call it an epidemic to draw people's attention to it. Fine. But ever since 2019, it's been coming down. And the latest CDC report that you're going to be talking about here in this article shows clearly that it dropped 30% over last year. And if you look and did a little reporting and a little fact-finding, well, you'd quickly find out that in the last four years, it's dropped over 60%. So how can you rationally call that a vaping epidemic. Okay, so let's actually dive into what she has here. Recent data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention indicates a significant decrease in the use of electronic cigarettes and other tobacco products among high school students, marking a potential shift in the vaping epidemic among American youth. Declining trend. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, and um, the purpose of this isn't to call out your mistakes, but it's to call out a much larger problem with the press nowadays. You take what's thrown at you, hook, line, and sinker, and then regurgitate it out, trying to extrapolate the scariest, most scaremongering aspects to the public, rather than digging deeper and looking underneath the surface and going, what? Why are they saying this? What is missing from this that they're trying to keep quiet about? There's no investigative journalism nowadays. Everybody just rinse and repeat, right? Well, not to call out your mistakes, but um, when you click on your link for the Centers for Disease Control, which is supposed to be from your recent data that, you know, you want people to go to, to, you know, fact check you maybe, well... That just goes to the CDC's homepage. And every time you click on it, it goes to the homepage. So here's a thought for you. Oh, I don't know. Maybe since, you know, you got something ahead of the time, ahead of the press release, you know, ahead of the actual, oh, I don't know, embargo clearance date and time. Maybe you link it to a relevant page at the CDC. I don't know. Maybe like the use and tobacco use page on the CDC's website that's remained there this whole time that they do the National Youth Tobacco Survey and publish this scaremongering story results. So you could, I don't know, look at the data. 
And maybe go to Internet Archive and see what that data and that web page looked like a year ago. And then, I don't know, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, maybe do a little investigative journalism. Do, do reporters do any of that anymore nowadays? And to be honest with you, and to be fair, you probably don't know this, but this page is nothing more than CDC propaganda. They just updated the latest propaganda for you guys to throw out there and scare the public, right? And you want to know, why am I calling it propaganda? Well, quite simply because the CDC, and for that matter, the FDA, likes to cherry pick the data to present the worst possible findings while simultaneously ignoring the most newsworthy findings that they leave up to you to dig to find out. Like, what would be newsworthy in this? Well, you kind of caught on to the fact that, well, there was a 30% drop. Actually, it was 29% if you want to be really specific about it and really technical and trying to be accurate. There was a 30% drop from last year. And you take a look at these numbers and, oh, man, there's lots of percentages and lots of percentages. And, well, quite honestly, most people, when it comes to math, if they're not good at math, well, they pretty much just, look at it and go, okay, yeah, percentage, percentage, uh-huh. It isn't until you actually put it in the terms that people can, can kind of relate to, like in 2023, about one out of every two, 22 middle school students reported that they had used electronic cigarettes in the past 30 days. And one out of every 10 high school students reported that they had used an electronic cigarette in the past 30 days. So when you put it in terms like that, oh, wow. That, that's pretty easy to understand. I don't need a percentage to understand that, 4.6% and 10%, right? But what happened to the reporter instincts of digging and finding out why are they presenting it in this order? Why are they talking about middle school students first? And why are they talking about high school students down below? And when you take a look at previous years, well, it's a different order. Why? Could it be perhaps because they're cherry picking the scariest aspect of the data they can find to, I don't know, push their agenda for total prohibition of all tobacco products of any kind? Could that possibly be something that they're doing? Or that they start this whole thing off with youth use of tobacco products in any form is unsafe? What a loaded statement, unsafe. For everyone? Really? How unsafe is it? Where's the comparison? Where can I find a comparison to, I don't know, put it into context of how unsafe is it really? Nah, they're not going to do that. They're not going to tell you how unsafe it is because it's their mission to achieve total prohibition of all tobacco product use regardless of consequences or side effects. And really, I have no idea why. Why would the government be doing this to us? Are they trying to hide the potential therapeutic benefits of nicotine? And who benefits from keeping that a secret? I mean, seriously, who benefits from the public not knowing that nicotine can help cure, treat, delay, mitigate, or ameliorate Alzheimer's, dementia, mild cognitive impairment, arthritis, autism, cancer, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, Down syndrome, anxiety, depression, PTSD, schizophrenia, multiple sclerosis, obsessive compulsive disorder, pain and analgesic management, Parkinson's, psoriasis, pyoderma, grandiosum, sarcoidosis, seizures, epilepsy, sleep apnea, Tourette syndrome, weight loss, long-term COVID, and last but certainly not least, how about smoking cessation? Why is the CDC focusing on preventing all tobacco product use when there's clearly a long list of diseases and conditions which benefit from nicotine consumption? Meanwhile, preventing tobacco product use among youth is critical to reducing tobacco use among the nation's youth. 
Why on earth would they write such a cyclical way of saying, we need to prohibit this as much as possible and stop the kids from starting, and if we stop them from starting, well, then they're never going to get sick. But it doesn't ever work out like that. It never has in the entire history of humanity. Forget about, oh, I don't know, the one million Americans suffering from Parkinson's disease and the estimated $14 billion annually spent treating Parkinson's. Forget about the 28.3 million Americans that are currently smoking cigarettes and the $240 billion in healthcare spending. Yeah, which the CDC itself, because this comes right from their website, states that it's more than $600 billion in 2018 when you include lost productivity from a loss of the workforce, because guess what? They have tobacco-related diseases and mortality that um, they have to go to the doctor for, and they routinely have to call off work to be able to go to these doctor's appointments and get these x-rays and all these scans and these treatments, and they're spent, you know, all this time going to the pharmacy to get the pills that they have to take every single day and the sprays and the asthma treatments. Forget. Just forget about that. Forget about the 6 million Americans with Alzheimer's. Forget about the 1 in 10 older Americans with dementia and only focus on the 1 in 10 youth that are um, illegally using, illegally misusing tobacco products in the form of electronic cigarettes in high school. That's all they want you to focus on. And these are not daily users. These are users within the past 30 days. So, I don't know. Who benefits from this being the definition? That current use is past 30 day use. So if you used one in the past 30 days, well, you're a current user. Doesn't matter whether your friends had it and said, hey man, try this, and you tried it, went, nah, that's not for me. You're a current user. You tried it in the last 30 days. And I guess over time, you know, maybe that could be a significant data, but by itself for one year, it doesn't mean anything. Yet, that's part of the CDC's definition of current use. Teens breaking the law to find out what the fuss is about because, you know, they saw PAVE and Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids advertising and telling every uninformed journalist that, you know, vaping is an epidemic and you need to press it and push this out into the news. And, well, you just regurgitated this whole vaping epidemic. And these kids are like, man, I don't, I don't use this stuff, but everybody else is. I, I want to find out what all the fuss is about. Right? Meanwhile, four out of 100 high school students use electronic cigarettes once a week, and only three out of 100 reported daily use. But is that actually what the data tells us? Huh? Is that what's actually in this report? CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, November 3rd, 2023. Titled Tobacco Product Use Among U.S. Middle and High School Students, National Youth Tobacco Survey 2023. Wow, this is pretty cool. Uh, I never knew about this kind of stuff. I heard about it all in the news, so let's look into it. And let's actually, I don't know, dive into the math and maybe take a look and see what these numbers are and what do they mean. And I don't know maybe actually do some math of our own to verify that what they're saying actually matches up with what's in the charts and the data. And when there's something, oh, I don't know, in multiple charts, well, you can check the math on multiple charts and they should come up with the same number. Even when they say on the bottom that, well, the numbers aren't actually going to work out because what we do, we round things off to try and make it simple for you to understand, right? So let's take a look at the figures. What do we have here? Oh yeah, there's plenty of words on this thing. We'll get to the words later. Let's just look at numbers. I'm a numbers guy. 
I can't help it. You know, math has always been something I've been fascinated about and thought it was pretty easy, right? As long as you have your times tables memorized, <laughs> math is simple. Yeah, sure, you got a couple rules you got to remember, but other than that, wow, it should be pretty easy. So what do we have going on here? Oh, let's take a look at it. Where are we going to start? The percentage of middle and high school students reported current use past 30-day electronic cigarette use, overall by selected characteristics and school level. Oh, it's all broken down. This is cool. We should be able to add up a bunch of numbers and come up with the same numbers they got. Among all students, it shows 2,130,000, which is 7.7% of the population for the kids in middle and high school. I look at this as an opportunity to do some math, right? Let's do some math. Let's figure out how many students are actually estimated to be according to their standards in middle and high school. And actually that's a really simple number to do. You just do a little bit of math and come to find out. Here we have among all students, 2,130,000, right? Which is 7.7%. So we got 2,130,000 right there, 7.7%, and 7.7 .7 is out of 100. That's what percent means, right? So let's figure out what 100% is when we know 7.7% .7 of um, this population is 2,130,000, um, 2, right? Well, we do a little bit of math, cross multiply and divide. And we come up with 27,662,337.66. And the 0.66 is left over from rounding because they rounded the numbers down. So we don't have the real numbers to work off of. Heaven forbid we actually get real numbers to work off of. We need to simplify it down. As long as you see three zeros there, that's good enough to foster a scaremongering campaign. But now we know exactly, you know, how many kids this is portraying as far as high school and middle school students, right? Well, that's pretty cool. So we see on here that um, the 7.7 .7 has a 95% conference interval of 6.8 to 8.6. So 7.7, .7, right? That's not 10%. That's not one in 10 teenagers. It's one in 10 high school students, as you can clearly see by the next column right there. Yeah, sure. Okay. But it's only 7.7% .7 is 77 out of a thousand students experimenting with these cigarettes in the last 30 days. Can you tell me how that's an epidemic? 77 students out of a thousand, right? And that is a 30% drop from last year and a 61% drop in the last four years. Hmm. Wow. I guess the CDC doesn't want you to realize that, well, any tobacco product use is now at a 50 year record low. Nicotine use as at a 50-year record low, including e-cigarette use. Deadly combustible cigarette use dropped 90% over the past decade. Why aren't these historical bits of data and facts talked about by anyone? Seriously? Chrissy Sexton, you wanted to know why I posted a pejorative tweet about your article. This is why. Where in your article was any of this data to be had? There's her Twitter handle for those of you out there that wanted to, you know, chime in on the conversation. And here's my post. And my simplistic way of putting something out there to say, hey man, what you're doing is not helping the situation. You're actually making it worse. Somebody from earth.com should, I don't know, want to look out for humanity, not just the planet, right? So I put on there, 
Another fear-mongering propaganda machine article by Chrissy Sexton in Earth.com. Vaping epidemic, half of students who try e-cigs get hooked. Well, that's a lie. Nowhere in the National Youth Tobacco Survey is there anything that tells you what percentage of these kids will develop a lifelong habit because they tried this and used it in the last 30 days. So I put on there, can't possibly celebrate e-cigarettes remain the most commonly used tobacco product. Because those of us on this channel know that, well, it's 95% less harmful than smoking deadly combustible tobacco, right? Cannot possibly exceed 5% the harms of cigarette smoking is where that data comes from. And when you take a look at cancer risks, well, <laughs> You're looking at 1% the cancer risk of smoking cigarettes when you're talking about vaping. But you probably don't know any of that kind of information and didn't probably dig into that because you just took what the CDC handed out there and bought it hook, line, and sinker. So when you saw my tweet, you're like, well, I better take a look at this. So that's what you said you did. You pulled up the CDC report to double check your facts. And then they found out that four out of 10 students continued to use e-cigarettes after trying them. The headline is updated. With that being said, I don't appreciate your post. You went out of your way to be rude. No, my intention wasn't to be rude. My intention was to, I don't know, call out the fact that these type of scaremongering headlines do nothing to improve the situation. And, well, your statement and their statement, which we'll dig into here in a moment, of uh, four out of 10 students continue to use e-cigarettes, doesn't mean anything. At least not what you think it means, and it certainly doesn't mean that they're hooked just because they continue to use it, meaning they used it more than once. So I just, while I'm sitting downstairs eating dinner, just threw together a real quick tweet reply knowing that I couldn't possibly sum up everything that I know that she needs to know before she writes another article about this topic into the limited characteristics of Twitter. And I just put on there, try writing an article that balances 480,000 American deaths every single year from smoking deadly combustible cigarettes with the CDC paper talking about illegal teen misuse of products that she probably doesn't know are proven successful at quitting smoking because, well, THR works. And, well, I know from firsthand experience that vaping saves lives. First and foremost, my own. I know how much better I feel since I quit smoking and have switched exclusively to using harm reduction to improve my life. You know, folks, in some ways, I really love Twitter. It allows you to directly notify anyone when you don't like or agree with something that they've done or said or published. It allows you to publicly call out the hypocrisy and force people to take responsibility for their mistakes. Unfortunately, I also hate Twitter because, well, it limits your response to a very short, limited character response that most of the time prevents me from actually getting my full thought out, let alone fully explain the situation in terms where they can see what they did was wrong. And hence the reason why this podcast episode is dedicated to you. Because I need a podcast like this. I need a long form. There's so many topics of conversation that you have to spend the time to learn about. You can't just take a short tweet or a short TikTok video and understand what the heck is going on. Yeah, it might be good for funny bits, but that's about where it ends. And how, despite my posting this, you still don't understand why four out of 10 students continuing to use e-cigarettes in this report doesn't actually mean what you think it does. It says right here, and this is where she got it from, despite the decline in e-cigarette use among high school students, close to 40% of high school students using e-cigarettes reported frequent use. Oh, that doesn't mean they're hooked. It just means that 40% of those kids that are actually using electronic cigarettes said that they use them more than once. 
They're not daily users. If you look at the actual data on there, you can take a look at it and it actually breaks down into, have they used it within the last one to five days or the last six to 10 days or the, or the last, you know, and it goes all the way up to how often in the past month have you used one? So if you had five of your friends in the last five weeks show you a vape and told you you need to try it to fit in socially, well, then you're going to put five down there. And you're going to be in this category of, well, you're hooked. No, you're not hooked on e-cigarettes. You're not hooked on vaping. You're hooked on, well, staying in the ranks of your social circle and, I don't know, trying to fit in. But that's not what this data tells us. We need to look at other numbers and try and figure out exactly what's going on. And the reason why I did the math to figure out how much were the daily users in this survey? Well, let's scroll and find the data. Okay, here we go. Table three. Among all students, we that's where we did the math to figure out how many students there were, right? And we did the math on daily e-cigarette use, which they did an estimated weighting of 530,000 people, which is 25.2% of all those people that are actually using e-cigarettes within the last 30 days. I love how they give you percentages of percentages and well, if you're not good at math, you're not going to do the calculations to find out that, well, the daily use of electronic cigarettes is actually 19 out of a thousand. Well, when you convert that back into a percentage, that's 1.9% of all teenagers in middle and high school. Since when is 1.9% an epidemic? especially when it dropped 29% from the year before. At 1.9%, you might even look at that and say, well, that's an easily explainable phenomenon, right? At-risk youth are going to be at-risk youth. Or you might even look at the 1.9% and say, that's an anomaly. Well, over the course of the years, we know that it's not just an anomaly, right? Kind of like how if you jump up to table one of this, I'm sorry, I know it kind of looks like I'm intimately familiar with this data, but when I see this kind of stuff, I dive into it. I'm like, oh, look at this, look at this. What is this? Wait a minute. Something on here doesn't make any sense to me, okay? Because in table one, it says the percentage of middle and high school students who reported ever using tobacco products by product overall and by school level, sex, race, ethnicity, and National Youth Tobacco Survey 2023 results. Scroll down. Heated tobacco products, 1.5%. Total estimated weighting numbers, 370,000 middle and high school students are using a heated tobacco product. Boy, that's funny because, well, I'm pretty good about this kind of stuff and I might be wrong. Might always, I might always be wrong. You never know. However, when it comes into tobacco harm reduction, I've been taking a deep dive into this since I quit smoking, right? And to my knowledge, the only heated tobacco product on the market is Icos. And while it has been authorized by the FDA for sale in the United States, and while the FDA has granted a modified risk tobacco product authorization for the manufacturer of ICOS so that these products can publicly claim that, oh, I don't know, the ICO system heats tobacco but does not burn it. This significantly reduces the production of harmful and potential harmful chemicals. And scientific studies have shown that switching completely from conventional cigarettes to ICO system significantly reduces your body's exposure to harmful and potentially harmful chemicals. But what it doesn't tell you is that none of them are available for sale in the United States. 
In late September, the ITC ruled that the iCoast device infringed on two R.J. Reynolds patents. And the whole time that this patent lawsuit was being fought in the courts, and then they asked Biden to take a look at it and review it after the International Trade Commission made its decision, well, it hasn't been for sale in the United States. You know, I once saw at a Sheets gas station the ICOS tobacco heating system. And it was advertised for sale. And man, I thought about buying it, but well, we just got done with our vacation and I didn't have that kind of cash to throw at it. This is going to be like a hundred bucks, right? So, well, whenever they um, did this survey, did anybody bother to question what heated tobacco products could these kids have possibly been using when there isn't a heated tobacco product for sale in the United States, right? Did anybody ask this question? Did the people that wrote this, that are supposed to be informed on this subject, because, well, they do this every single year, right? The National Youth Tobacco Survey is a cross-sectional, school-based, self-administered, web-based survey of U.S. medical and high school students. It's stratified, right? Three-stage cluster sampling procedure generating a nationally representative sample, right? That's what they say is their method. If you scroll up to the front of the paper, that's how they do their data collection and that's how they process it. And, you know, if you read into it and you come to find out, well, it's collected between March 9th and June 16th. And, well... Resulted in 22,069 students from 179 schools to answer their predetermined questions using this web-based survey. That the report does not disclose an actual link to or a copy of the questions that are asked. So my question is, what are they really asking these kids and how much of the self-reported replies are truthfully answered? How many of these kids take these surveys seriously? And, well, how many of these kids answer the question based upon what they think is the cool way to answer the question that they're asked? And how on God's green earth can they take what 22,000 students say and translate it into the 27,972,973 kids are going to do across this entire country? And the short answer is, they can't. Then it's not what this survey is for. At its best, the National Youth Tobacco Survey and this publication of propaganda they put out there, at best, it's useful to monitor trends over time, like the massive 30% drop in teen vaping from the year before, and the 61% drop in the last four years of National Youth Tobacco Survey data. It's useful to realize that when you look at the data and you look at the charts, you can come to find out, and this is nowhere in the report, this is just looking at the data and figuring out the numbers. It's, it's, it's useful to realize that teens, well, they're smart enough to try a less harmful e-cigarette over a combustible cigarette, two to one. But my question is, when you take a look at the data and the frequency of combustible tobacco use, how come it doesn't break it down like it does for e-cigarettes, right? Where's the statistics in this entire report that shows the frequency of combustible tobacco use? How often are the kids smoking a cigarette? How many times in the past 30 days did they smoke a cigarette? Did they not ask that question? It's not in the data. It's not broken down. They didn't talk about it. Why? Is it perhaps because, well, <laughs> vaping eliminated cigarette smoking for the middle and high school students? 
except for those still kids that are going to, you know, steal pack from mom and dad and have their friends try it, right? Because they want to be cool because, you know, they're, they're at-risk youth that are going to do, oh, I don't know, at-risk be youth behavior, right? Or is it because, you know, vaping eliminated teen smoking? And if that's the case, wouldn't you want to everybody celebrating this, that there's an entire generation of smoke-free kids? You would think that we would be celebrating the lowest rates of tobacco use in 50 years, let alone a 61% drop in teen vaping over the last four years. Or, well, since I'm the kind of person who likes to ask all kinds of questions, you know, you take a look at it, carbon monoxide levels after initiation of new generation of heated tobacco products. And this is one of the scientific studies that tells you, oh, Icos is heat not burn is better than thing, but it's not for sale. Is it perhaps the CDC doesn't want you to know that, well, nicotine is not all bad? Is it possibly because the CDC and the FDA know the well-known alkaloid is as benign as caffeine? Huh? Or is it because, oh, I don't know, nicotine without smoke is... Well, harm reduction? Huh? Tobacco harm reduction? And perhaps, oh, well, they ignore it because it doesn't fit their prohibitionist agenda? Or maybe, maybe it's because, well, uh, vaping eliminates smoking. And, well, that would mean that their budgets would all dry up. Campaign for tobacco-free kids? Well, yeah, they'd still have all their leftover master settlement money, and that's why they're going and focusing their attention on nicotine because they know there's no more teen smoking. They know that people are smarter than you give them credit for. So what do we actually know, right? Looking at the data over the long term, I have a beautiful chart posted by Dr. Chauncey Gardner, Charles Gardner, says four massive changes in four years. Meanwhile, the media reports only one of them. Teen vapors. What do they have it listed here in 2023? Well, teen smokers is down 60%. And teen vaping is down 61%. Meanwhile... They also don't like to talk about adults. Despite the fact that 480,000 American adults die every single year from cigarette smoking. And, well, we do hear because the lawyers want to, and the regulators and the, and the legislators all want to pass these new laws, ban flavors and ban this and tax that and ban vape mail. Well, why are they doing that? Maybe because adult nicotine vaping increased 7 million people and adult cigarette smoking dropped 8 million people. Oh, wow. Whose pocketbook is that going to hurt the most? Just think about that for a moment. Huh? Huh? Who's going to lose the most amount of money if this trend continues? With the current rate of decline in smoking and the current rate of vaping growth, you can clearly look at this chart and see that vaping is going to overtake cigarette smoking in 2026. And, well, if you continued the lines all the way out, well, by 2040, adult cigarette smoking is going to be below the 5% threshold necessary to declare that the United States is a smoke-free country. You know what? If these trends continue unabated, the United States will have eliminated cigarette smoking by 2040. And this isn't because of Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. This isn't because the FDA determined what was appropriate for the protection of public health. No. You know who this is credited to? 
although nobody wants to talk about it. It's all us ex-smokers out here telling everybody, you know what? Vaping saved my life. All these ex-smokers are going around telling all of their smoker friends, you know what, dude? Vaping is cheaper. It's a more enjoyable way to consume nicotine. Oh, and by the way, you're going to improve your health and well-being once you fully stop smoking cigarettes. And I hate to tell you this and burst your bubble. If you're in the press or the media or in marketing, we're working for a pharmaceutical company or a big tobacco company. No amount of propaganda is going to stop this. No amount of FDA agency capture is going to stop the black market supply of vaping products consumers want to never smoke again. The war on drugs proved laws and prohibition do not stop customers from getting what they want. Prohibition only increases prices, increases harms, and well, is a complete and utter failure because all it does is increase the criminal justice workload and the number of people you have incarcerated in your country. Meanwhile, the regulatory captured FDA's blanket denial of all flavored vaping products only drove safe, self-regulated market from the mom and pop operations into the hands of big tobacco and the black market. Every single government intervention and tobacco control policy only further drives this disruptive technology to evolve even better and more concentrated, which consequently results in more people successfully quitting smoking when they try these products. You know, Trump instituted Tobacco 21 and banned flavored pods. So what did the vaping market do? They said, okay, we'll just need to make the entire vape now disposable. Did it help the situation? Or has it caused the biggest environmental hazard which didn't exist before government involvement? Think about that for a minute. Before the PMTA and before Tobacco 21, did you ever see a disposable vape laying in the street? Or were all the devices completely reusable and only the coil or the pod or the battery needed an occasional replacement? The self-regulated industry had products which were environmentally friendly and consumers only needed to replace what actually went bad. Now, the whole vape gets binned, and everyone is ignoring the laws. Please tell me how that is appropriate for the protection of public health. All public health officials and government regulations have done is foster the mistrust in the agencies that are charged with their protection. CDC, tobacco-free, right? Nicotine is highly addictive and can harm the adolescent brain. Vape aerosols can also contain other harmful chemicals like heavy metals. Share vaping facts with your students. Yeah? Guess what? Nobody believes you. CDC is highly dishonest and harms people who consume nicotine. CDC communications can contain false claims like lies, half-truths, and evidence-free speculation stated as fact. If you're looking for vaping facts, the CDC is not the place to find them. Nor is the Surgeon General's report, e-cigarette use among youth and young adults, a report of the Surgeon General. Because when you dig through there and you take a look at it and go, what are the harms and what are the effects of e-cigarette use? Well, it's a potential adverse health effects for youth who inhale e-cigarette aerosol. Include those on the body from acute administration of nicotine, flavorants, chemicals, and other particulates and additional effects, such as nicotine addiction, number one. 
Number two, developmental effects on the brain from nicotine exposure, which may have implications for cognition, attention, and mood. Well, this is kind of funny, but isn't that one of the beneficial therapeutic effects of nicotine consumption among a whole host of things like cognition, attention, and mood? I mean, if you got mild cognitive impairment and they tell you, you know, consume nicotine on a regular basis, use a patch or whatever, right? And it's going to improve mild co- your, your mild cognition and it's going to improve your attention and mood. But you know what? If you're a smoker or vapor, you already know these things because you have firsthand experience of the direct effects of using it. And when you don't need it, well, you don't use it. And those of us that have been doing this long enough and talking about this long enough come to realize People self-medicate when they pick up this device. And the people that don't need the self-medication, they turn out to be users that tried it and completely give it up. But the people that use this on a regular basis, there's fundamental characteristics that cause that person to continue to use the product. We have major problems in this country and we're wasting time misinforming the public to achieve an end result of prohibition that'll never happen and it'll never work if they do try to legally pass it. Does nicotine damage the developing adolescent brain? No, this is a scare story and claims do not bear scrutiny. When you have somebody that looks at the scientific data, they can clearly go, well, no, that was just a statement in a freaking paper that got repeated multiple times. And there is no real scientific proof to say that. Matter of fact, when you take a look at the information, the data, Einstein, one of the most brilliant people in existence that I was ever made aware of, right? Was a regular smoker, pipe smoker, consumed nicotine. Didn't seem to affect his intelligence at all. Some public figures, including the U.S. Surgeon General, have suggested that nicotine damages the adolescent brain. The evidence for this hypothesis comes only from a few rodent studies. These are an unreliable guide to human risk because the rodent brain does not offer a reliable proxy to the human brain. And it is difficult to design experiments that are controlled to give the mouse equivalent exposure that a human is going to have. But this is not the main reason for doubt. Over the last 60 years, millions of adolescent nicotine users have grown up as smokers and either continue to use nicotine or they've quit. The problem for the Surgeon General's report and others is that there is no sign of any cognitive impairment in the population of former teenage smokers and many of today's finest adult minds were young smokers. If a detrimental cognitive effect on nicotine existed in the human population, it is inconceivable that we would not already have seen this extensive evidence in the study of smokers and non-smokers and ex-smokers over the past several decades. Imagine that. So, does nicotine damage the developing adolescent brain? Well, quite clearly, no. Is nicotine the wonder drug underutilized to treat a whole host of diseases? Well, quite honestly, yes. Look at this entire list of diseases and illnesses that can benefit from nicotine usage. Meanwhile, corporate greed is preventing an FDA-authorized product for tobacco harm reduction because they actually looked at the analysis and said, okay, you can make these health claims about this product. Meanwhile, because of the corporate greed and the patent war that went on and the legally binding date of it 
April 30th, 2024. These products are nowhere to be found on the market. But the CDC report says that, you know, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of kids that are going to be using these heat not burn products, right? And I'm sure PMI will roll out the ICOs for those diehard smokers in the United States who still want an actual cigarette, but prefer one that's going to be safer for them and not kill them. And while we're dealing with all this crud here in the United States, UK smokers are urged to swap cigarettes for vapes in the world's first scheme. One million smokers will be encouraged to swap cigarettes for vapes under the pioneering new swap to stop scheme designed to improve the health of the nation and cut smoking rates. Wow. One in five smokers in England are going to be provided a vape starter kit alongside behavioral support to help them quit the habit as part of the series of new measures the government is doing to meet its smoke-free 2030 goals. That's fantastic. But see, let's be honest. They did that because they know they have been promoting vaping to quit smoking. And well, while it has worked, the last couple of years have showed that the data of cigarette smoking prevalence is kind of flatlined. So you want my honest opinion? I think this is a wonderful move to nudge lifelong smokers into trying electronic cigarettes. Despite the constant fear-mongering news stories put on that permeate the entire globe when it gets published online. But I honestly think it may not be enough for some hardened smokers who need a much higher nicotine level than what is legally allowed in the UK or by EU TPD laws. They arbitrarily arrived at this 2% cap. And quite honestly, it might be preventing the successful transition of UK smokers to a less harmful product. Because, well, in the UK, they also banned snooze which worked for Sweden to become the first nation in the world smoke-free, which is defined as less than 5% of the population smoking cigarettes. For those of you that didn't know this before, think about it. What would it take for England to change the cap from 2% to 5%? Common sense would say, well, if you had actual science that demonstrated that the benefits of having 5% solution versus a 2% solution result in a higher success rate for smoking cessation, well, I think the UK parliament would follow the science and up the limit from 2% to 5%. You know, there are thousands and thousands of studies comparing vapor to air because well, all we should ever breathe is clean, fresh air. Forget about the fact if you live in the city and you got the buses driving around and all these trucks emitting all these diesel soot and fumes and how bad that is for your air. But focus on the fact that all you should ever breathe is air. Can we please be realistic? When are we going to actually take a pragmatic solution to the situation, looking at the data, raw data, looking at the facts and going, hey, man, here's, here's a study here that shows if we give them 5% solution, we can get four more out of 100 to successfully quit compared to limiting them to a 2% solution, right? Who's going to do that scientific study? It's certainly not going to be funded by the NIH and their prohibitionist agenda because their goal is to completely eliminate all tobacco use of any kind whatsoever, right? So who's going to do this data and who's going to do the study? So far, well, the manufacturers are doing scientific study and research, but whatever they do, the rest of the scientific community completely ignores it and shuns the people that choose to do the industry science. So you've got this clashing dogma between 
ideologues. You've got people that want prohibition and you've got people that are pragmatic and want harm reduction. So who's going to do the science on it? Are the manufacturers going to do the science? And how long is it going to take to save these people's lives? Or are we just simply going to leave things the way they are and eventually the problem's going to resolve itself? Right? Everywhere you look, all you see is disease and death and hypocrisy with no real solutions. 72% of Americans are overweight. 29% of adults have been diagnosed with depression. And in America, 25% of all Americans are on psychiatric medication. And would you be surprised to find out that more Japanese died of suicide than COVID? When are we going to focus on saving lives, ending misery, suffering, and premature death. More than 6 million Americans have Alzheimer's. 1.2 million Americans have Parkinson's disease. And one in every five deaths in the United States is caused by cigarette smoking. Meanwhile, nicotine vaping can improve all of these. So perhaps instead of exaggerated fear-mongering stories, how about we just tell the unadulterated truth and let people make up their own minds? That's what they're going to go and do anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to another episode of the Facing Hypocrisy podcast. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, please feel to leave it in the comments below. I hope you all have a fantastic, healthy, happy day. And my wish is always peace, love, and a hunky vape to end cigarette combustion. See you all next week.